Hello, everybody, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first episode of Cameron's One Shots. And you might be asking yourself, Cameron's One Shots, what is this? Well, this is a podcast for me just to do one shot episodes of just any random topic. And it will be really helpful because I'm a history major at Black Hill State University with a minor in American Indian Studies. And so for this specific podcast, this is actually fulfilling a assignment that I have to do, which is to create a podcast about one of our topics. Now, this podcast is for the class History of Latin America. So today's topic is going to be about Japanese immigration to Latin America. So go ahead and grab some coffee, some tea. If, if you're on the road, maybe turn the volume a little bit up, but keep your eyes firmly on the road and just sit back and get ready to listen about some information about Japanese immigration to Latin America. All right, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that if you hear any background noise uh, all it's just people in my dorm moving about or cleaning up i didn't have time to set up a proper recording studio but i'm just going to do with what i got so the first segment of our show is just background information on japanese immigration to latin america latin america was not actually the first choice for many japanese people to come to it was actually north america so that included hawaii america and canada actually were much more popular choices but in 1908, uh, America, the USA, signed the Gentlemen's Agreement, which banned Japanese immigration to the U.S. And so Latin America, uh, Mexico, and South America became just second options for many Japanese immigrants to go to. So why were Japanese citizens immigrating to the Americas? Well, this had to do with recent events in Japan. So the Meiji revolution that established a new modern japan uh japan officials pursued a program of modernization which didn't help all japanese families it made some very poor and they went through some hardships and so when they heard tales of some earlier immigrants that had gone to latin america who had been able to make more money and be able to send the money back to their families in japan Many Japanese who were going through poverty and hardship saw that as an opportunity to go to Latin America to make more money than they were making in Japan and then be able to send the money back to their families. And the Japanese government actually supported a lot of these modernization lanes because, I mean, if you're a country who's wanting to make a bigger economy, than having people make money and then send it back to your country, yes, it's going to help your country a lot. So Japan's policy for immigration was to sometimes sponsor or subsidize immigration companies to take Japanese citizens to Latin America to do contract work. And there was also another reason why Japan was also willing to send some of its citizens to Latin America. It's because it was they wanted to experiment and prototype with colonization in Latin America to maybe use that later with their expansionist policies, which is what we see with Japan when they uh, invade and take over Manchuria and trying to establish a Asiatic empire. So I don't have enough time in this podcast to go through every country in Latin America, but I will definitely hit on some of the biggest ones. So let's start with Mexico. Mexico was fairly popular. A lot of contracts were for mining companies for Japanese to do work in the mines. Uh, The conditions were very poor, to say the least. Many of the Japanese weren't prepared to do that kind of hard work in the conditions of Mexican heat in northern and southern Mexico. And furthermore, Mexican officials and employers were not living up to their side of the deal, were not paying the Japanese workers what they should have been paying. So they wanted to go back to Japan. Well, the fare for Japan was actually really expensive, so it actually left them stranded in Mexico. And so there were two options for the Japanese to take. One was running away to the U.S. in where they were mining in northern Mexico. That was enough, uh, a short amount of space for them to just illegally cross the U.S. border. Or they could stay in Mexico, which is what happened, and they established the Enomoto colony, which is where most of the Japanese in Mexico stayed for the remainder uh, up until the present day. There is also Peru, where a lot like Mexico, um, 
contract Japanese workers went to work on sugar plantations. They were treated even worse than Mexico, and their uh, working terms were not met. And instead of fleeing to another country or going back to Japan, which they couldn't because the fare was too expensive, they actually uh, went to Chile instead. Brazil, a lot of the Japanese went to Brazil after the gentleman's agreement. In fact, Brazil took on the most Japanese immigrants during the biggest spike of Japanese immigration before World War II, and they went to work on coffee plantations in lieu of slaves that Brazil had recently abolished. The last country I'm going to touch on is Argentina, because Argentina actually has a little bit of an exception. Yes, Japanese went to go work on farms or mines to make money to send it back to their families, but many Argentine intellectuals also saw the Japanese as very Western and very, like, the most white Asians, as they would say, and they were believing that the Japanese culture would be able to mix with Argentina modernity and help Argentines become more Western themselves. So the effects of Japanese immigrations to most of the Latin American countries is that most Japanese couldn't go back to Japan because it was too expensive. So instead, they formed colonies in each country, and these colonies were very segregated from mainstream society. The Japanese kept to themselves, and this had the impact or the consequence of creating distrust for nat native members of each Latin America country, and it would ultimately lead to internments during World War II. The next segment for this podcast episode today is titled Japanese and Latin American Perspective. So we're going to see how the Japanese viewed or were, what were Japanese experiences and perspectives on Latin American countries and what were Latin Americans seeing or expected of the Japanese. So let's start with Latin Americans. What did they think of Japanese? Well, they saw them as very hardworking and very honorable and they really liked the Japanese culture. What we also see with most Latin Americans is that they viewed the Japanese a lot better than the Chinese. There were a lot of Chinese workers in Latin America at the time, but the Chinese were viewed as untrustworthy or lazy because a lot of the Chinese workers were single males, as opposed to Japanese workers who actually brought their families with them. So many Latin Americans believe that Japanese males want to be as rowdy as Chinese males. To kind of go more into specifics, we're going to go back talking about Argentina. Kind of what I mentioned on earlier, Argentines, a couple of Argentine intellectuals believed that Japan was the most Western country in all of Asia. Um, there were a couple of Argentines who went to Japan at different times. Um, they pointed out the culture. They pointed out how Japan had been able to seemingly mix new western ideals with old japanese tradition like they had a perfect fusion of this it would be the most perfect example of cultural pl pluralism what further convinced latin america that japanese were better workers to other immigrants was the fact that japan had been pursuing western values and a program of modernization and so based on that alone many latin american countries saw the appeal in having Japanese immigrants in their country. So now we're going to talk about what the Japanese believed. Well, even though they were in another country, many of the first generation Japanese, or the EC, believed that they were still Japanese citizens, and they had a good reason to believe this. Japan still claimed them as Japanese citizens all the way up until World War II. So even though they were in Latin America, they thought that they were only there temporarily, that they were going to go back to Japan with, as one would say, a suitcase full of money. So that is the mentality that we have to focus and think of when we're thinking about those first generation of Japanese immigrants and their experiences. When the Japanese workers kind of go back to Japan, they saw other Japanese workers who were also stranded in Latin America as the only source of solidarity, which is what led to the segregated Japanese communities. This doesn't always mean that Jap the Japanese immigrants kept to their own. In fact, when there were Japanese immigrants during the time of the Mexican Revolution in the 1910s to 1920s, we actually see some Japanese immigrants become part of rebel groups in northern Mexico. To kind of touch more on the Japanese worker experience, at first when they realized they were stranded in Latin America, they kept working on 
either plantations or on sugarcane farms or in mines until they had enough money to move to urban cities to open their own shops. We see many barber shops open up. We see stands and markets. And even in Argentina, we have the growth of Japanese business-owned uh, flower shops. And so just to kind of wrap up on the Japanese and Latin American perspectives and just to go over it again, uh, Latin America saw the Japanese as with this oriental lens that they would be really good for the countries and the Japanese saw Latin America as a land of opportunity that they'd be able to go for a temporary time but they couldn't go back to Japan so they ended up just staying there. The third segment of this podcast today is about Japanese identity. How did the experience of the lives of Japanese workers lived in Latin America affect how they saw themselves? And furthermore, how did their children or even new waves of immigrants affect the identity of Japanese in Latin America? So we're going to do this in three different ways. We're going to start with the first immigrants who went to Latin America. Then we're going to move on to the children born to those immigrants. And then thirdly, we're going to go to either the grandchildren of the first immigrants or the new wave of Japanese immigrants that went to Latin America uh, post-World War II. So let's start with the first wave of immigrants that were born in Japan but went to Latin America. Um, This generation of Japanese immigrants are called the Isi, and I believe that's connected to the Japanese language in numbers where uh, EC, part of that means one. Really, their identity, they really saw themselves as Japan citizens, kind of something I touched on earlier. Um, The communities they created within Latin American countries, they truly believed that these communities were just colonies and owned by by Japan, the Japanese empire. And so what we really get is these first generation of EC seeing themselves as a nation within nations. And so this happens with every Japanese community within Latin America. And what we see with those uh, communities of the first wave of Japanese is they want to stay Japanese. Um, They don't want to assimilate into the culture of the Latin American country they're in. They teach Japanese values at schools that they built. They don't really teach Portuguese or Spanish at all. And furthermore, when they start to have children, they don't want their children to start to appropriate the culture of the Latin American country they're in, and they are really against interracial marriages, so not married, not marrying any of the Latin American natives in the country that their community is in. So the children born to the EC or the NISI, and that's N I S E I, just because if I'm not pronouncing the Japanese correct. Uh, someone will be able to know what I'm talking about by the spelling of it. Anyway, what we see with the children from the EC, those who are born natural to Latin America, is they actually appropriate the culture or start to assimilate into the culture of the countries that they're in. And so when their parents or when Japan tells them that they're Japanese, they think, no, I've never been to Japan before. Why would my loyalty and why would I expect myself to have any identity that's connected to Japan. And so what we really see with the Nisi is not an identity battle of Japanese versus Brazilian or Japanese versus Argentine or Japanese versus Mexican. What we actually see is a cultural identity battle between Japanese and Nisi. Another turning point from the Isi is that the Nisi, the Isi's children, we're actually more okay with marrying uh, Native Latin Americans, which made the EC very mad because they're more traditional and they want to stay Japanese. And the reason for all this, the EC wanted their kids to stay Japanese so that when they went back to Japan in their minds, that their children would still be considered Japanese. Lastly, we have the third generation, or this is called the Nikki which has become a very popular topic of study. Um, the Niki, or children of the Nisi, or the grandchildren of the Isi, or they can even be the immigrants who came from Japan to Latin America after World War II. And what we see from the third generation of immigrants is that they view the first generation, the Isi, as backwards 
because they haven't been to Japan for a long time and they haven't seen how Japan has modernized after World War II. And vice versa, the EC think that the Niki are very lazy, that they don't have any work ethic at all. And so what we see from Japanese immigration that as time goes on, that each generation that's either born in Japan, goes to Latin America, or is born in Latin America, has their own experiences that help create their own identity that's separate from any other generation of Japanese immigrant. All right, so the last segment of the podcast today is going to be talking about legacy, that because of the past and the experiences and the perspectives and the identities all that come from this topic of Japanese immigration to Latin America, what is the legacy of it? Well, there are many Japanese communities still in Latin America today. These communities are proud to have both their heritage of being Japanese and also being Latin American. What we also see is some new studies being done on these experiences. Most of the books that I read are fairly recent as this is really a new kind of field that's been opening up of what were the experiences, what were the motivations, and what were the consequences of the Japanese immigrating to Latin America. Unfortunately, what we do also see in Latin America today is there is still problems of discrimination and racism from Brazilians to the Japanese or even the Peruvians to the Japanese as well and the legacy of that is just because of the actions of the Peruvian government or the Brazilian government especially during World War II it's made it hard for some Japanese to forgive their Latin American counterparts or it's made it hard for some Latin Americans to view the Japanese immigrants and generations of new Japanese Latin Americans to be viewed on the same equal level as them as just human. And I think there's a good comparison to be drawn here about about the effects and the consequences of Japanese immigration to Latin America, and these effects in this history can be easily applied to the United States because just of our immigration past as well, and just thinking through how immigrants from Western Europe or from Eastern Europe, or even from Asia as well, how immigrants from all over the world have their own sort of struggles and how these struggles are incredibly similar to the ones that the Japanese faced while in Latin America. I think lastly I want to touch on how the legacy of this also impacts the Japanese who are going back to Japan. Those who have Japanese heritage were born in Latin America and they go back to Japan and the Japanese natives view these Latin American natives that have Japanese heritage as inferior or less than and i think this whole set that the study at this research topic is trying to show is that we all kind of have the same struggles in life and we are trying to do the best we can and because of that we should be able to have more empathy and mercy towards one another for trying to just better our lives and probably not just for ourselves but also for our families as well I think this can also kind of lead to some questions about where we are going to go from this point on, knowing the history of Japanese immigration to Latin America. What can this research and and this knowledge mean for the future? Well, I do think that we'll see a lot more research on the experiences and the inner thoughts of Japanese Latin Americans And even with the new generation that are being born in Latin America, it's going to be interesting to see if they'll hold to more of their Japanese traditions and heritage, or will they assimilate more into Latin American culture. Okay, that is going to wrap it up for this episode today. I wouldn't expect any more podcast episodes soon since this was just for college, but who knows, maybe I'll have some time over the summer to do some more reading, more research, or something like that. Anyway, to do an outro for this podcast i just want to say thank you to dr wyant who is my professor for my history of latin america class thank you for just the lectures and the topics that we went through in that class i feel like i learned a lot and i feel like it was very useful for me creating this podcast episode now i want to go through just the list of books that i used for my research so that this can have a 
bibliography kind of feel, even though the podcast technically doesn't need one. And also, I think it helps any of the listeners who are interested in further reading on Japanese immigration to Latin America to know the books that I use. So the first book is The Japanese in Latin America by Daniel M. Masterson with Sayaka Funada Klassen. I'm so sorry if I pronounced names wrong. Uh, just look up the pronunciations. I'm sure you'll find the book. The next book is Dysphoria and Identity, Japanese Brazilians in Brazil and Japan by Miko Nishida. The third book is Looking Like the Enemy, Japanese Mexicans, the Mexican State and U.S. Hegemony, 1987-1945 by Jerry Garcia. The fourth book is The Japanese Empire in Latin America, edited by Pedro Iaco Belli and Sidney Sulu. And the fifth book, and also my personal favorite book that I read, was Samurai in the Land of the Gaucho, Trans-Pacific Modernity and Nikki Literature in Argentina by Kyochi Hagimoto. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Cameron's One Shot. I hope you learned something about Japanese immigration to Latin America. If you thought something like this was very cool, go ahead, do your own research as well, and also share this with friends and family so they also know just about what you've been learning in life. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and see you later.